Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. Welcome to Harvard Kennedy School. I'm Nick Burns. I teach international politics and diplomacy here. I want to pay a special welcome to our dean, David Elwood, who's done so much to build our school. Welcome him back from his recent trip. And I also want to welcome Trey Grayson, who's the new director of the Institute of Politics. It's his fourth official day at the Kennedy School. Welcome, Trey. Tonight's discussion and debate on the dramatic events taking place in the Arab world, in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Yemen, is being sponsored by the Institute of Politics, of course, because the Institute of Politics runs the forum and is such an important part of the school. Sponsored by the Kennedy School's Middle East Institute and sponsored by the Center for uh, Middle East Studies, Harvard University. It's streaming live on www.iop.harvard.edu. Before we get to the panel, before we get to the discussion, I also wanted to bring to your attention an important forum on this coming Monday evening, February 7th. The forum is thinking about leadership with some very important guests. Nan Keohane, member of the Harvard Corporation, former president of Duke University and of Wellesley College. Dean Nitin Noria, the dean of Harvard Business School, will also be here, as will Professor Monica Higgins of the Harvard Graduate School of Education. I hope if you're here at the school, or if you want to watch online, that's an important forum on Monday evening. But tonight, we're going to discuss what all of us, I think, have been consumed by over the last several weeks, and that's the extraordinary events un unraveling, unfolding, I should say, in the Arab world. Starting in Tunisia, with the fall of the Ben Ali government, now focused on Cairo, Tahrir Square, and the battle between reform and pro-Mubarak demonstrators we've all watched live on television over the last couple of days, perhaps some demonstrations this weekend in places like Damascus, in Syria, or in Sana'a, in Yemen. And we'll ask our panel what they think of these events, whether they'll persist, and what their meaning is for all of us outside the Arab world. We have four outstanding professors, all at the Kennedy, at the Kennedy School or Harvard University, starting with my good friend and colleague, Tarek Massoud, Assistant Professor of Public Policy, now a media star. You've seen him all over American and international media over the last couple of days. Welcome, Tarek. <laughs> professor Malika Zegal, who is a professor in contemporary Islamic thought and life at Harvard University, who's a great expert on Tunisia, but also on Egypt. So we look forward, Professor Zegal, to your remarks. Professor Roger Owen, A.J. Meyer, Professor of Middle East History at Harvard University, and a, a, a recognized expert on the history of the Arab world. And our good friend Rami Khoury, who is associated with the Kennedy School, part of our leadership team at the Belfer Center, director of the Issam Faris Institute for Public Policy and International Affairs at the American University of Beirut. Rahmi is visiting us this month, so his visit's well-timed to help us think through these events. I thought what we could do, both in the discussion here on stage, but also when we get to all of you and you ask your questions and tell us what you think, is focus on three issues. There is a pan-Arab narrative of reform being written in these events. It's being written by young people. Some of it is leaderless, as we saw in the streets of Tunis and initially in the streets of Cairo. What caused the youth of the Arab world to take to the streets in the way they've done, largely in peaceful protests, clamoring for democracy, openness, greater human freedom? Are we going to see further ramifications in the fall of governments, as we saw in Tunisia? And is this going to last? Will it persist and turn into reform movements that can actually succeed in changing the way people live and changing the freedoms they have or don't have? That'd be my first question to focus our panel and perhaps to focus some of you. Secondly, Egypt, the keystone country of the Arab world, largest country, 85 million people, has known three presidents in its modern history, all generals, Nasser, Sadat, and Mubarak. Are we witnessing in Egypt the type of profound change that could lead to a revolution, reform, freedom, or are we also witnessing today in President Mubarak's speech just a couple of hours ago when he was very critical <coughs> of President Obama, when he said he'd stay until September and that they'd essentially take back the streets. Are we witnessing a counteroffensive by the Egyptian government against the protesters over the last 24 hours? And finally, how should the rest of us who are not the actors in this drama watching from Harvard, watching from all the countries represented here, how should we react? 
What's the role of the international community, of the UN, of the Arab world? What's the role of President Obama and the United States? And what's the proper balance here between public statements calling for reform, perhaps, and quiet diplomacy behind the scenes trying to influence the Egyptian government and some of the other regional governments to move forward on the agenda that the people in the streets believe is a very important one. So there's a lot to talk about. This is a wonderful panel. And I'm going to ask Professor Tarek Massoud to start us off. Tarek, um, what is your perspective on the meaning of the events that we're seeing? Uh, thanks, Nick, and thanks, everybody, for coming and being interested in this, uh, in this topic. I, I did not know that people were interested in the Middle East. Uh, uh, so, so I think that, uh, you know, the meaning of this event, I think, in, in part, you're right, this is a kind of a pan-Arab story. This begins in Tunisia with a fruit seller who'd been wronged, burning himself. And now we see that uh, the people of Egypt uh, were inspired by what happened and are now uh, demanding their own rights. Uh, you know, as I've said before, there's a kind of cultural change that you observe in Egypt. Now, I have the worst timing of anybody in the world, right? So uh, I left Egypt on the Friday before these protests started. Uh, and I, told, I had to tell my chairman you know, that I wanted the fall semester off because there were elections happening in Egypt. And I, I needed to be there as this momentous event of elections occurred. And of course, nothing happened during the elections except for fraud. And I was very depressed. And it's only when I leave that you say, OK, now we're going to do this. But I think in part they were inspired by the Tunisian example. Before Tunisia, uh, Egyptians would see protests. They were protests by these young people who were trying desperately to get something started. And I think folks would walk by them and say, God bless them. You know, they're really doing God's work. But, you know, how are you going to unseat this regime? This regime has full command of this society. Uh, how are they going to get rid of it? After Tunisia, when Ben Ali left, I think it created a real change and a sense of the Egyptians' collective efficacy. So now, after Tunisia, they'd walk by a protest and think, well, they did it in Tunisia. We can do it here. So I think that's one of the most significant things about this, um, uh, is not just the, the kind of pan-Arab nature, but the deep cultural change that isn't going away. And then the regime, of course, with its response, who would have thought that Husni Mubarak, okay, this very boring gentleman who seemed to be, over the last 30 years, committed not simply just to keeping himself in power, but also to slowly reforming the society, getting rid of the command state, etc. I mean, this is a country where they had spent a lot of time trying to convince investors that they were not a banana republic, that you could invest there, that it was a country of laws. And they hadn't been completely successful in that effort, but they'd been somewhat successful. Who would have thought that in order for him to stay in power, he would have shut off the internet uh, and taken all of these very dramatic steps to foment disorder, which will, of course, even if they allow, even if these moves are successful and let him keep his seat, they will have completely obliterated whatever legacy of reform he could have laid claim to beforehand. So these are things that um, we could not have seen. And again, even this provoked a cultural change, because how did the Egyptian people respond at this complete failure of their state, of the exposure of their state as really not interested in all in protecting them? Uh, they responded by protecting themselves. And so you know, whatever happens, whatever the end game is in this particular uh, scenario, I think that the Egyptian people are uh, going to be much more formidable uh, than they were uh, previously. Um, the question that you had asked about whether this will, will result in a kind of democracy, whether this will, how will this resolve itself? Uh, this is where we move from the inspiring to the very boring and mundane and technical, because how do you transform this, as you say, uh, youthful, semi-leaderless movement, this uh, you know, expression of popular anger and desire for freedom and for reform into an actually concrete uh, group of individuals who can negotiate with whoever they need to negotiate with in order to actually affect concrete uh, transition to democracy. And that is going to be, uh, be much harder. Um, so do you want me to keep going? I, I don't know what the, the rules are. I mean, I have five minutes to, f to continue. The rules are that you have about a minute left. Okay, okay, fantastic. Good, 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 good. Um, so, so the main issue, as I see it, is this, um, that basically you have two paths right now before you in Egypt. The first path is that 
the opposition, the people in the street, somehow, by some process, figure out who will represent them. And those people who represent them will negotiate with the regime on a new constitution and an entirely new set of institutions to govern Egyptian society. That's one way, and that's what many of the protesters are asking for. They want Mubarak to leave, they want to put this constitution aside, and then they want concrete negotiations about a new way forward. Another path that you might take would be to actually use the existing constitution to affect democratic reform. And this is the gambit that Mr. Mubarak is trying to play. He's saying, let me stay in power, and I will actually lead this process of constitutional reform. Uh, the parliament, of course, has to discuss any bills, any, any amendments to the constitution. Allow me to stay in power and do this. And of course, the Egyptian people are not buying it. Uh, they do not at all have any faith in Mr. Mubarak's ability or desire to actually lead, to, to lead a, a genuine reform process. Uh, but there could, be, if, you know, there could be a kind of middle path between Mubarak staying until the end of his term and getting rid of existing institutions. Because the thing I worry about, you know, if Mubarak left and, you know, the, and they said, we're going to suspend the constitution and negotiate a new one, what I worry about is Mohammed al-Baradi and the representatives of the opposition now sitting down with Omar Suleiman or whoever it is they need to sit down with. And Mubarak is left and the crowds have dissipated because they have achieved their victory. And Omar Suleiman will look at these, these people, these opposition leaders who have no formal mandate and who no, now no longer have the force of the crowds behind them. They may have the threat of the force of the crowds behind them, but the crowds aren't there anymore. And one worries that he could take them for a very long ride and that we would not see reform in the near term. Now, I'll tell you another thing. You know, in the past, I mean, I, 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 I didn't see this coming, right? I didn't see this. So now my prognostication of what would happen if Mubarak left, you know, take it with not a grain of salt, take it with a big bucket of salt. But, uh, but this, is the, this is the worry, and so how to get to the next stage is a, is a question. And Tarek, a very quick question, and I'd like the others to consider this as well. If we look back at other reform revolutions in recent history, Russia had Yeltsin, and Poland had Wałęsa, and the Czechoslovak uh, state had Václav Havel. Is that who El Baradai is, or Amr Musa, or is there a nucleus of people who represent a group that can contest for power with the state, an authoritarian state? I think that uh, this, is the, this is the question. Uh, El Baradai uh, certainly has the potential to be that. Whether he actually is that, I don't know. Um, I hear conflicting reports. I see conflicting images. Uh, Al Baradi uh, greeted by protesters as a kind of, uh, a, you know, uh, um, you know, embodiment of their hopes. Others images are of Al Baradi ignored by many protesters and people thinking, who is this gentleman who's coming, parachuting in? He's not been with us through our struggle through the years. I think that is a question, but I also think it's not the main question. I feel as if the opposition could get their act together enough to have him at least be. If not there, will end at least the kind of you know the kind of dutiful clerk who will sit and transmit their demands to the regime. The question is, will the regime actually negotiate in good faith? Thank you, Professor Zagal. You are, are unique in, in the respect that you are an expert on Tunisia and you're an expert on Egypt. And I think we also want to hear about your reflections on what just happened in Tunisia with the fall of the Ben Ali government and whether or not you see links between the protest movements or at least inspiration. There. Of course. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start by saying that this is um, quite an extraordinary moment for the history of the modern Middle East. Um, the Tunisians started um, by ousting their uh, dictator on January the 14th of 2011. Uh, this is the first time it happens in the history of the modern Arab Middle East. And um, it has shown to others in the region that it can be done. So it has really opened up the domain of possibilities, the domain of political imagination. It's um, really the wall of fear that has fallen uh, with this event, I think, and that has changed the psychology, the culture um, of the region. And um, I'm not sure if other countries of the Middle East will necessarily follow in the footsteps um, of Tunisia and maybe Egypt. 
Uh, but the pressure is now on all the authoritarian regimes of the Middle East, and I think that's an important moment. What has happened in Tunisia and what may happen in Egypt and what has already happened in Egypt, in fact, is probably the sign of uh, future deep changes in the region of the Middle East. And all these countries uh, you have um, um, spoken of in pan-Arab movement, all these countries have similar economic and political problems. Um, let me go back to the Tunisian um, revolution um, and the current events in Egypt too, because I, I think there are real similarities um, there. The, the, they are caused by a lack of economic and political opportunities in the context of dictatorial regimes. Um, and the catalyst of the revolution uh, in Tunisia was really the suffering caused by unemployment. Unemployment, especially the unemployment of the educated youth, as exemplified by uh, Mohamed Bouaziz's emulation in Sidi Bouzid on December 17. But I think these movements in Tunisia and Egypt have to be analyzed beyond the usual cyclical bread riots that we have seen going on since the 70s um, in the Arab Middle East. Um, the movement became very quickly a political movement. And, um, you know, I spent a long time looking at all the economic demographic indicators. And frankly, um, the idea of a specificity of Tunisia that was developed before Egypt started does not convince me anymore. Um, I think there is a deep political change, a deep cultural change that has started to really take place with those um, those uh, protests and um, this revolution in Tunisia. The demonstrations in Tunisia in particular, but I suppose it's, I think it's the same in Egypt, so they really cut across all sectors of society. There was no Islamist slogans uh, during the demonstrations in Tunisia, uh, no leftist slogans, no ideological demand. The demand is a demand for radical political regime change, um, for freedom, Horia, uh, karama, dignity, the notion of dignity comes back all the time. I heard it in Egypt too. Um, representation and government accountability. Uh, these are very, very deep demands coming from those um, demonstrators. Now, does the revolution in Tunisia mean real regime change? I think it's too early to tell. In Tunisia, the head of the regime is gone, but what about the pillars of the regime? And I'm thinking more particularly about the police, uh, on the one hand, and the party in power on the other hand. These are still there, and we have a real institutional problem there. Um, you're asking, what do we need? We need expertise on how to operate um, with the transition, how to institutionalize um, democracy. We have the same discussion as in Egypt, do we need a drafting constitutional assembly or not, or do we only need to reform our constitution? Should we start with elections or not? And frankly, do we need a presidential regime? You asked, do we have men or women at the head of these movements? This is a people's movement without heads. And so do we really need another charismatic leader who will confiscate the political resources and the economic resources? That's my question. So uh, that's a question that's very much on the table currently in Tunisia. Now, um, another question that I would like to um, ask um, it's the question of Islam and the Islamists. Um, if you look at the media in Europe, but also in this country, in the United States, um, the current events are often read through the lens of the Iranian Revolution of 1979. Um, so is the alternative between a pro-Western dictatorship on the one hand, um, or an Islamic state on the other hand. I think we should not read the situation in these terms. I think we're beyond uh, that type of alternative. Um, and this is something um, I'd like to, to discuss uh, maybe a little bit later. I think these are national liberation movements. They are liberations that are Tunisian, Egyptian, maybe Syrian, et cetera, et cetera. I think what we see um, are not jasmine revolutions. I don't like the term jasmine revolution. I think it markets Tunisia as this miracle of uh, you know, economic growth, which in fact it was not. Uh, I think it's a Tunisian revolution and it's not gonna be easy. So I think jasmine is not the right term and it's not the season for jasmine in Tunisia yet. Um, so I'll be, I'll be very cautious um, about this. 
If the Islamists come back, and they have come back already in Tunisia, Rashid al Ghanoushi has come back, uh, they will have to participate in a democratic transition as any other movement. Uh, there are other movements in Tunisia. All the political opposition movements are extremely weak because they have been, in fact, weakened by this regime that we had, in fact, not just under Ben Ali, but also under Bourguiba. So the opposition is extremely weak. But if we have a transition towards democracy, a real one, they will participate as any other, and we'll have our debates, we'll have our cultural wars. But I think it's time for us to be able to have those debates and to think freely about the relationship between state, Islam, and politics. Um, I think truly the Tunisian and Egyptian experiences can inspire um, other populations in the region. I think the army has played a pivotal role in Tunisia and is playing, of course, a pivotal role in um, in Egypt, um, the army for the moment has not repressed the demonstrations um, contrary to uh, China in 1989 and contrary to Iran in 2010. So I think it has hinged really for the moment on uh, the, um, the behavior and the state of mind um, of the army. Um, and today it seems to me that um, the decision to lead or not to lead towards a transition in Egypt is really in the hands of the army. So we'll have to, to wait and see. Thank you. And very quickly, Professor, I just wanted to ask you a follow-up question, if I could. Sure. Um, there's been a revolution in Tunisia. The authoritarian leader fell. But it has there been reform? Uh, will there be a true revolution to change the way that government serves the people? Or are we likely to see just new faces, new names, but the same authoritarianism? It's a very good question. We don't know yet. The people in the street, the pressure of the street has um, forced the first interim government to dismiss the old faces and to bring in new faces. So that's a very good sign. Um, there is today a, um, a commission for uh, political reforms that, ha that is headed by Ayad Ben Ashur, who is uh, one of the top uh, lawyers in the country, and uh, he's working with constitutional lawyers in Tunisia. So there are signs of hope, uh, but I think everybody has to remain very vigilant. We'll see how uh, the youth in particular uh, and the new media can play a role um, in this um, popular vigilance. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes. Professor Owen, um, you've observed the Middle East for a long time. Is, are we witnessing epical change, or perhaps change that might not bear fruit? Well, I, I'll say a few words about the Pan-Arab background, if I may, Thank and you. then come to that. Thank you. Uh, in, I, mean, I had the uh, good fortune or the misfortune to complete a manuscript about which I called Presidents for Life and the Politics of Succession, which has been rapidly uh, overtaken by uh, events. <laughs> And uh, I shall have to have a very large epilogue. But um, I will say a few words about Presidents for Life anyway, because this is the phenomenon, this is the background to what we're talking about. And then say something about the, uh, the, the turmoil in terms of the basic weaknesses of the regimes concerned. So why so many Presidents for Life? And what are we talking about, or what were we talking about at the end of last year? There are nine Arab republics seven of which are ruled by president which seven of which were ruled by presidents for life five in north africa and two in the arab east so basically we're talk, we're talking much more about a north african phenomenon than we are about a uh, uh, the eastern part of the arab world at this particular moment um, of these uh, republics six were ruled by someone over 60 Syria being at the owning exception. And of these, one has, was in power since 1969, that is Gaddafi, once since the 70s, three since the 80s, and once since the 90s. So one is dealing with what I call a club of increasingly old men who not only showed no intention of leaving until they were carried out, but in many cases had every intention of allowing a relative of some kind, a son if they had one, to succeed them. So that is the old world, which is still there up to a point, and which is under attack. There were two main reasons for this. One was the ability of regimes to coup-proof themselves after the many military coups of the 60s. So basically, if you were in power in 1969 and you coup-proofed yourself, 
by Colonel Gaddafi, who happened to be the military leader of the revolution, you remained in power. And you are still in power. And this was also helped by the fact that the Arab world had a greater centralized administrative and bureaucratic system um, coming out of the colonial period. And there's also a possible demonstration effect here. I think when uh, uh, Abdelaziz Bouteflika of, of um, Algeria decided to abolish the two-term limits for a president by changing the constitution, he was surrounded by cronies who said to him, Abdelaziz, do what everybody else is doing. This is what seemed to be the way in which a kind of Arab demonstration effect, this seemed to be the way in which these regimes were run. And they had many similarities. They were strongly centralized security states run by, in a very personalized way, by a president and a crony elite involving the top echelons of business, the army, and so on. But in my last chapter, I was going to point to the many weaknesses, and I think this has something to do with our uh, discussion. They were extremely inefficient regimes, however centralized. They could not manage prices. They could not manage anything except in security terms. And there was a link, I think, between the cronies and the inefficiency in that uh, this long string of accidents that has beset Egypt, ferry disasters and so on, was clearly something to do with cronyism and inefficiency, which became more and more as time went on. Then these regimes found themselves with the need to legitimate themselves by elections and the manipulation of constitutions. And this proved an extremely difficult um, role, because elections could be overmanaged, and I think Egypt is a perfect example of that, of a complete misunderstanding by Gamal Mubarak and his friends in the National Democratic Party. So overmanaging the election, not allowing it by any opposition, and really calling attention to, instead of legitimizing, delegitimizing the regime by their activities. Then there was the question of succession. And the fact that after the, there was a great deal of uncertainty and so on about who was going to succeed these old men and a legitimate concern about what was going to happen. And finally, everything appeared to be getting worse in the last years as um, the presidents got older. And I could feel this palpably when I was in Tunisia a year or so ago when the young men of Tunisia were in despair. This hideous family that is ruling us they didn't say that because they didn't dare, but I could feel them thinking, this hideous family will just go on and on and on. Even after Ben Ali dies, his wife will be there and then his son-in-law will be there. So there was absolutely no hope. So I think they were unstable, not stable, as, and they were ripe for the nationwide demonstrations, but no one could actually have seen the spark that ignited them. And now I think we're having a counter-demonstration effect spreading from one Arab uh, country to another. Uh, as for the lessons, I think we have to look. This is not happening everywhere. There are some places where um, things are better than others. Kings seem to be doing better than, uh, than presidents at the moment, and Rami, I know, has some ideas about this. You are also protected by sectarianism. In Lebanon, you can't have a strong president. All Lebanese presidents last for six years, unless the Syrians say that they should last for nine years. But still, they leave. And in Iraq, you have a weak presidential system because it's also sectarian and there's a kind of balance. So in fact, you are lucky to live in Lebanon and Iraq and have been much less lucky to live in one of the North African states. Uh, and then I think, as we've mentioned, there is the question of the army and just... Um, ending on a note about where we are with Egypt. I think it's generally understood among the American officers that I deal with that the Egyptian army is extremely weak, actually, in terms of its fighting capacity, its ability to do anything very much, wholly dependent on American aid and American support. And therefore, I would think the weak spot of um, the Mubarak regime that... Uh, Field Marshal Tantawi, the head of the army, is aware that, he, that if, the, uh, 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 if uh, Barack Obama really got tough with him, they would be in difficulty. But certainly, the study of armies and the relationship of armies and what is the military interest is back with a vengeance. And I'll stop there. 
Can I just ask a quick follow-up yeah. question? When I lived in Egypt many years ago, mm -hmm. the army may have been weak relative to other militaries in fighting capacity, mm -hmm. but it was seen to be kind of the backbone of the country, an honored institution, trusted by a lot of people. And mm -hmm. I was struck by the statement that the military made three or four nights ago, we will safeguard the people mm -hmm. of Egypt. And in fact, today they went into Tahrir Square and it literally separated these two warring groups. Mm -hmm. So is it a question of external weakness, but perhaps being um, the institution that might be the safeguard, the, the pillar of a transition? Do you see that potential in the Egyptian military? Well, I think institutionally, yes, it has a reputation. Whether it has the capacity to do things, to clear the streets without an enormous amount of bloodshed, whether it can even act efficiently as an internal security force seems to me to be tested. And then we assume we talk about the army. And I think we're back to this, the question of um, there are generals who have one set of interests. There are colonels and people with troop command who led the original um, military coups in the 50s and 60s who may have quite a different idea and uh, who are much more likely to be politicized and concerned with what they're doing. I think that's how I would answer that. Thank you very much. Uh, our final speaker is Professor Rahmi Huri, who uh, is a big part of our Middle East uh, program here at the Kennedy School. We're really happy he's here. Rami, you live in Beirut. We've now just traveled in this one discussion from Tunisia to Egypt. We've talked about some other states and now Beirut, also turbulent. One question, if you would just touch on in addition to your remarks, is how, do, how, how does Hezbollah view these events? How does Hamas view them? How does Iran view them? I think you have a unique perspective based on where, you're, where you live. Uh, thank you, Nick. Um, it's always a pleasure to be back at the Kennedy School uh, at Harvard. I'm actually spending this month at the Farris Center at Tufts University, and I thought if I came in February, I could watch a lot of good college basketball games and you know, yeah, yeah. stay in for the snow. Stay and for get, March Madness. Get some work done, and, uh, <laughs> but now it's, uh, we're busy with all this stuff going on in the Arab world, but uh, I think it's a, it's a really extraordinary moment. Um, and l let me make a couple of quick comments about the general themes, and then I'll answer your questions, particularly about Lebanon, Hezbollah, uh, and Iran. Um, uh, I think it's really important to understand a few things, and I say this based on 40 years of the last 40 years living in the Arab world and traveling, traveling around uh, constantly. What's going on now is absolutely no surprise. Anybody who studies the Arab world and looked beyond the surface manifestations of the exercise of power uh, would have understood that there was massive discontent below the surface. And if you take just Egypt, for example, they've been trying for years, the judges, the Kifaya movement, the Muslim brothers, uh, the trade unions, the student groups, the human rights activists. They've been doing this year after year after year for the last 20, 30 years, uh, and they've been hit over the head by the state with the direct, uh, consistent, and uh, unrelenting support of foreign governments, especially the United States and France and Britain and the European Union. There is no surprise about what's going on now. Why did it happen now? It happened now because a combination of degrading uh, experiences has afflicted hundreds of thousands of young people across the region who can't get sufficient jobs. If they get a job, they don't get enough money to get married. If they get to college, they may or may not have the opportunity to compete equally uh, in life, a combination of social and economic pressures, political degradation, corruption, abuse of power, watching the continued Israeli colonization of Palestinian and Arab lands and attacks against Arab countries, watching foreign armies coming in year after year and attacking different countries and threatening them and making regime change, watching the massive hypocrisy of Western governments uh, to bend the rules about who can have a new peaceful nuclear power and who cannot. Um, a cumulative number of degrading um, treatments that the average citizen has felt that have culminated in not just a process of degradation, but dehumanization. People felt that they had not just lost their rights as citizens, but they had lost many of their attributes of, of humanity, of human beings. They weren't allowed to listen to what they wanted to on the radio. They weren't allowed to read what they wanted to. They weren't allowed to have a public debate. They couldn't talk openly in some of the severe security police states in the Arab world. They couldn't even talk with their neighbors. They were afraid of who was listening and what would happen to them. This went on for decade after decade after decade, and finally it snapped. And one guy burned himself in, in, in Tunisia, and, and then the wave spread. You mentioned uh, uh, Poland, Lech Walesa. 
the, the, the Tunis situation I wrote when it happened is a solidarity situation that it starts in one place in the Arab world and it will spread like solidarity brought about the fall of the Soviet Union 10 years later and the whole Soviet empire. So I think the reason for this is that the nature of the grievances and the complaints that ordinary people have are very common throughout the region except for the rich oil producing states. You don't have these situations in Qatar or Kuwait much of Saudi Arabia, UAE, etc. But you have it in the, in the 85% of the rest of the Arab population. The nature of the degradation is the same. The nature of the political rule, the control of power, the exercise of power, the abuse of power is very similar throughout most of these countries. The monarchies have a little bit of a different uh, situation. They have a little bit more legitimacy for various reasons. And I, uh, paradoxically, the monarchies tend to be a little bit more account susceptible listening to their people. They feel more vulnerable, therefore they act with more accountability and they're a bit more sensitive to what their people uh, feel. There's some fantastic information that has just been made available recently by the Gallup organization, which has done some amazing polling about young people in the Arab world in every single Arab country. Three polls in the last year and a half for this group in Qatar called Silitec, which does studies about the transition from education to work. And polling among something like 50 or 60,000 Arab young people between the ages of 15 and 29 revealed some amazing uh, data that we knew instinctively but has now uh, verified. Uh, for instance, the number of young Arabs in this age group who are mostly well-educated that want to immigrate and leave permanently averages around 30% for the whole region. Uh, but a third of the best educated, most productive young people want to leave their countries. They just want to get out of there. And in Tunis, and particularly in Tunis, they say, unlike most of the rest of the Arab countries where they say they want to leave mainly because of economic opportunities or the jobs, prices, cost of living, in Tunis they say because of the nature of the government system. They're fed up with being degraded and, and, and treated without their basic rights. And the number of young people who want to immigrate in places like Morocco reaches 43%, in Tunis it was 46%. Uh, percent. And then you have data, for instance, confidence in the judici judicial system. Uh, the number of people who have confidence in the judicial system and the young people is around 50%. Half of them just have no confidence uh, in it. Confidence in the government roughly is the same, around 50-55%. Uh, About uh, 30 to 38 percent in, in most of the uh, poor and middle income Arab countries, only about 30 to 38 percent feel that the elections are credible. Two thirds of the people don't feel the elections make any sense whatsoever. So th there's lots of data like this. Only a third of young people, and this is the age 15 to 29 when they're getting married, setting up houses, only a third say they can have any chance of finding affordable housing. Two thirds have no chance. This is the young people of the Arab world speaking. The more important than all, and there's lots and lots of this data, go to silatech.com and you can find it, or the Gallup site. And this, is, this has been known for years, but nobody's done anything about it. Neither the Arab power structure, nor the foreign governments who support them. The other important thing is that all of this sentiment among young people is almost identical with the adults. There's virtually no difference among young people and adults in the Arab world in this data, except for one statistic, which is young people are more likely to want to immigrate because of the nature of their lives. Yet older people are not susceptible to wanting to immigrate. So we have a really serious problem that's been building up for years and years and has now uh, exploded. I think what we are seeing is not just discontent that explodes and wants to uh, change a, a leadership. What we're seeing, I believe, is the, the most historic moment in the modern Arab world. In the last century, uh, in the last 110 years uh, since, or last 100 years since the birth of the modern Arab world around 1920, um, we have, I think, for the first time, the beginnings of a process of popular self-determination in the Arab countries. The first time ever we will start seeing Arab citizenries defining their countries, defining their power structure, their policies, their national values, their sectarian religious balance, the role of the army, the control of the military, accountability of finances. We're seeing for the first time the possibility of self-determinant Arab citizens, not just saying they want to be free, but saying they want to organize their countries. They, we, what we may be seeing is the re-legitimization, or I would say the first ever legitimization of governance and power structures in the Arab world. If things move s smoothly, this is the most important moment since the birth of these countries. 
uh, 90 years ago. And, and we had another moment in the 70s and 80s when most of these countries were taken over uh, by the security services and the, and the military and have, have kept this region locked uh, in this uh, condition for, uh, for so long. It's interesting to note that the slogans that um, we're hearing that people are calling for dignity, freedom, equality, are exactly the same thing that the Islamist movement started talking about in the 70s and 80s. al karama wal adala dignity and, and equality, exactly the same things. Once the population with a sectarian uh, trend uh, brings us out into the open, the Islamists will mostly melt away and go back to getting their 15, 20 percent. The Islamists will be like George Wallace in the South. They'll always get 15, 20 percent. They won't get more than that. Once the other people step up, there was nobody else who could challenge the governments when the Islamists were there. Therefore, they became the, the big uh, boogeyman. Um, last point, I think I've run out of time. Last point. Um, these transitions take a lot of time. It took the Western world 500 years to go from the Magna Carta to the French Revolution. It took the United States 300 years to go from slavery to giving women the vote and giving blacks equal rights. These things take time. It's unrealistic for simpletons on American television or other people to start looking at us. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> simpletons who work for the networks. The guests are always really great. <laughs> simpletons who work for the networks. Uh, for, for, uh, uh, and there's some simpleton politicians, but well, we won't name them. But you're not a politician. We're not going to name any names tonight. No. But for right. people to expect this to happen quickly and say what's going to happen next week and what's going to happen next month is unrealistic, unfair, and will be seen by the majority of people in, in the Middle East as a continuation of the kind of Western racist colonialism double standard that they're fed up with. And I think a subscript to this issue going on now is that people who are criticizing their governments will also start criticizing those foreign powers who supported them for many years. So I think what the U.S. should do, you ask what the U.S. should do, should just leave the, the U.S. should come out for the first time ever and put its policy where its mouth is and say, we support freedom, we support equality, we support self-determination, we will deal with any elected government that accepts majority rule and protects minority rights. They should apply the same standards in the Arab world that it does everywhere else, and people will rush to embrace uh, the United States. Hezbollah, Iran, you mentioned the Hezbollah and Iran and, uh, and these groups. These are a manifestation of a response from populations to conditions of degradation of double standard, of predatory foreign uh, attacks, and many other things that they complain about. In Lebanon, the absence of a strong central state meant that somebody had to emerge and address issues of uh, ending the Israeli occupation or uh, uh, helping the Shiites stop being third-class citizens. The rise of Iran is, is well known, the Islamist uh, revolution, which has now, I think, become largely delegitimized. Uh, there's many different specific reasons for what's going on in, in Iran uh, and Lebanon, which are specific, uh, I believe, to those countries and should not be uh, generalized. The point is the United States and the West and the Europeans and others missed the boat when they, when they refused to deal with Hamas when it won a democratic election. They should not miss the boat again this time. The United States should stand with democratic elected people, the consent of the governed. That's what this country stands for. That's what it should define its foreign policy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank all four of you for, for your insights and uh, your willingness to share the, your views. We're going to go to questions in just a minute, but very quickly, Rami has now put on the table the third question. What should the United States do? I wonder if, in, in a very brief 30 to 60 seconds, what should President Obama, Obama do? We talked in my class today about President Obama perched on a high wire, no safety net, juggling competing priorities. He has done what Rami said. He's thrown his rhetorical support to the people of Egypt. He has had an open disagreement today on television with President Mubarak. And yet, that's one part of the juggling act. The other part is the real concrete national interest, the fact that Egypt has a peace with Israel for the last three decades. If that were to be abrogated, all bets are off in the Middle East. The fact that Egypt has been standing with the U.S. and Europe on counterterrorism, the Suez Canal lifeline, open to Europe, energy flows, the fact that Egypt has been containing Iran with the rest of the Arab world and the U.S. There's a lot at stake for the U.S. Does the president have the balance right 
in this very difficult, complex envi environment, Tarek? <laughs> um, he's certainly got a very tough task ahead of him. Um, you know, look, I mean, I think he's trying to do the right thing. Uh, you know, you can't, on the one hand, have this policy that uh, uh, Rami described. I wouldn't describe it in quite such, uh, you know, eloquent or uh, forceful terms. But, you know, you have had this policy where we've got long-standing alliances with these governments. And, you know, I, so I can understand why you would be reluctant or why he would be trying to thread this needle, um, you know, a little bit delicately. But I think, look, the end of the day is this. Um, you know, you can't bet against the people. You can never bet against the people. So eventually they are going to achieve their freedom. And then they're going to ask, where was the United States when I was uh, engaged in this process? Was the United States with me or was it against me? And I think if the conclusion is that the United States was against them, that's a much greater risk to our foreign policy long term in that region than any of these other short term issues. Thank you. And Professor Gazegal, has the president said enough, done enough to? indicate to the Arab people the test that Tarek just posed for him. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure he said enough. Uh, we'll see how he's perceived in a few weeks or months. Um, what I see is um, that Obama is probably uh, a little bit at a loss. Uh, it's hard to, to walk uh, this, this, fi difficult, this fine difficult. line and it's hard to know what to do. Yeah. And so it tells me that the Obama administration is not leading things here. They're not uh, leading the whole situation. They're waiting. They're very reactive, but not necessarily leading the whole thing. Um, so there is an element of weakness, in a way, in this new um, position that the U.S. Um, has in the region. Um, just a note about Tunisia. I think Tunisians were very lucky that nobody paid attention. Tunisia was very lucky not to be part of the big geopolitical game in the region. Because Tunisia is not important in terms of the alliances um, that are taking place in the Middle East. So, of course, um, Tunisia is an ally of France and the United States, but it doesn't play an important role in diplomacy. And therefore, they were left alone to do their revolution. And I think um, they were lucky to be left alone for some time. Thank you. And Professor Owen, you get the last word in this round. President Obama said the other night, he said, this is my words, I can't remember exactly. This is not about us. The Egyptian people will decide this. Foreign governments should not be dictating, directing, deciding. Is that weakness, as Professor Zagal is, or is it a strength, and is it an insight into how distant, perhaps, we should be as in, in intervening in these affairs? I don't think you could be purist about it. I think that uh, he's in, and his words will be carefully weighted, and it was my impression that he'd worked out some kind of end game with Mubarak in their long conversation on Saturday night about going gracefully and doing various kinds of things. And uh, whoever is calling the shots in Egypt has, has, has defied him and humiliated him as far as I'm concerned. And so I don't think he can, re he has to recover from that with some pretty forceful language, it would seem to me. Otherwise, he will be accused in the Middle East of, of being just another hypocritical American president and um, in, uh, that, he's, that he's being told by the Zionists to keep Mubarak in power and keep the peace treaty in, in place. That's my own feeling about that. Thank you. We'll go to questions. And, you know, to give President Obama his due, President Mubarak just hit back at him rhetorically mm. a couple of hours ago. Yeah. So We'll see what happens tomorrow in this fast-paced crisis. Mm -hmm. We're going to go to the audience for questions. A couple of ground rules. There are four microphones. You see one here on the floor, one there, one in this balcony where the gentleman is already standing, and one here. And I'll just start over here. A couple of ground rules for you. Please identify yourself just by name. Uh, second, um, brevity is always appreciated at the Kennedy School. Uh, third, statements and questions always end in a question mark. Chad, from Lebanon, one of our great students here, you've got the floor first. Thank you. Uh, my question touches on, on, on what you've been uh, talking about, uh, specifically the American position, uh, the American administration. Um, unlike Lebanon, Egypt is not used to the lack of uh, order 
Uh, it is used to an order uh, of things, stability for the past 30 years, uh, just like many regimes, in, whereas the Lebanese are used to chaos and they used to have their lives continue without government, let's say. My fear is that if, is it possible that the, the need of order of the, of the Egyptian society in the, in the actual situation of chaos, if it is extended for a while, might it, is there a tendency or a possibility that the need for order uh, creates calls for the army to re-establish that order. That would also coincide for the, maybe the same level of, uh, of fear on the, on the international level of the Americans and, the, and Israel that are also afraid of this extended situation of chaos because of the obvious interests of Israel. And could those uh, low level of tolerances uh, of the, in, the, in the Egyptian society and on the international community, particularly America, coincide in wanting the military to fast come in and to kind of uh, re-put some order in that chaos with the risk being that there's a perpetuated uh, Suleiman scenario negotiating with no one and it's a kind of a pushing down then the effect, the positive effects of the latest revolution. Thank you, Jack. Uh, Tarek. That's, that's a great question. I think certainly that we've seen that uh, the regime strategy, part of the regime strategy to deal with this was to allow or foment the kind of chaos that you're talking about and, and gamble that it would create a yearning for order or return to normalcy. Um, and I think what we're seeing is that that hasn't quite worked. Uh, that on the contrary, what it generated was more anger at this regime, uh, more of a feeling that uh, you know, the fundamental change needed to uh, occur. The real test and is, is going to come, I think, tomorrow. There's a, a large protest planned. Um, and this, I think, will be, uh, We'll see if this ends up being a kind of street battle, who will show up to the protests, and what will the army do? The one thing that I found puzzling in all of this was the reaction of the Egyptian opposition to the, uh, the uh, arrival of the army onto the streets. The, the protesters uh, really greeted the army as a kind of national institution uh, that was um, restoring order. And, and, uh, but in fact, Egypt has always been a military regime. So even though Mubarak had in recent years been, you know, teetering between uh, naming his son or, uh, but this always, the underpinnings of this regime had always been military. And so part of the blame for the misfortunes of the Egyptian people always lay with this military regime. The military controls something like 40% of the Egyptian economy. And so what worries me is, is exactly as you said, a yearning for order, therefore an acquiescence to the arrival of the military and the military uh, taking control, which will then have resulted in a change in nothing. Yes, please. My name is Arik Ibrahim. I'm a mid-career uh, candidate and I'm Egyptian. Uh, the question is about a third scenario, uh, and my question is, that, is to, the, to the panel, a third future scenario, whether the panel would see as, as a possible scenario or not. Is it possible that uh, the international community, along with the U.S., are able to exert enough pressure so that uh, the vice, next vice president would be a person who is slightly likable to the Egyptian and acceptable to uh, U.S., such as, for example, Amr Musa, and then they would, uh, uh, and then President Mubarak would be uh, asked to step down because something like this, I think, would be acceptable to uh, the Egyptian people who do not want to see him or anybody on uh, representing the old regime uh, in his place. Thank you. So an interesting suggestion. Amr Moussa, former Egyptian foreign minister, secretary general of the Arab League, could he be a transitional figure? Could al Day to help pave the way for, I think, this very good suggestion how they might move forward? You know, the, you mentioned, uh, again, the Poland example. Uh, I think we shouldn't rule out the possibility that somebody like, say, Omar Sleman could turn out to be a Jaruzelski. General Jaruzelski, who was named by the Soviets to uh, take care of solidarity, turned out to be somebody who worked with solidarity for a peaceful transition to democracy. Um, so th there has to be, among the 80 million wonderful Egyptians, there has to be 50,000 qualified people who can play key leadership roles in a society that has uh, approximately five and a half thousand years of running its own affairs. I mean, this is the most organized, experienced, 
society at managing urban development and human dignity anywhere in the world. There's nobody who has more experience than the Egyptians. So I don't think there's any problem in that scenario. There's a perfectly realistic one. Will the Egyptian people be allowed to do it? I think this is the big question. This is a critical moment of transition now to see how these various opposition forces will work together uh, to bring about the, the, the transition. Transitions are tough uh, for military rule. I'm worried about too much emphasis on the military as the great savior. Uh, militaries are good at defending borders. They're not good at running internal affairs. And I think we should take the focus away from the military. Thank you. Yes. Uh, my name is Brian Haggerty. I'm a PhD student in international relations at MIT. Uh, a number of you have, have pointed to the role of, of the military as the great unknown going forward. And I hate to put emphasis back on the military. But I wonder uh, if you could comment specifically on civil military relations in Egypt versus Tunisia and then versus these other countries that we're looking at now and what may happen in these countries. What do we actually know about the relationship between Mubarak and the, and the military in Egypt, Tunisia. especially versus the relationship between uh, Ben Ali and the Tunisian uh, military also? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Professor Gaw. Yes, um, great question. The, the Tunisian regime under Ben Ali was not a military regime. It was a police state, uh, even if Ben Ali had um, origins within the military. Um, so what the pillar of the regime was the Ministry of Interior and the political police. And therefore, the police was, in a way, the spoiled child of the regime. And uh, the army was, in a way, marginalized a little bit in terms of resources. It has only 12 helicopters. I don't know if you realize what it means. So it was, even during the revolution, it was very much stretched. And um, it took a, a neutral position in the sense that, more than a neutral position, that uh, General Amar, who was, uh, uh, the head of the army refused to fire on the demonstrators. He was fired by Ben Ali and then came back after Ben Ali left, right? So the army in Tunisia, it doesn't have the same uh, standing as in Egypt. It's not, you know, the army of Abdel Nasser and it doesn't have the same, uh, I would say, national standing. It's not the, 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 um, the spine of the regime, but it played an important role by refusing to fire on the demonstrators and la later um, took a more neutral position, uh, protecting the, the protesters in the street until the end, until the, uh, the second interim um, government um, in January, I think January 17, if I remember well. Um, so it played a very important role, not in the transition that we're going to see now, but before that in the sense that it has led um, the revolution toward um, order rather than chaos. Tark. Yes, Professor, please. Yes. I mean, I, we talk about the army. I think there's the perception of the army by the Egyptians, which is on the whole a good perception. There's the army's own perception of itself, which I think it's in a great state of fear at the moment, and there's a great deal of division. Um, not feeling that it doesn't want to be drawn into politics, that it will be drawn into politics if it starts killing a large number of people, not knowing what is best for it, how to protect its interest in the, uh, in the peace treaty and in military industry and so on. So I, th I see divided councils at the top. It's not as though Field Marshal Tantawi can just give an order and everybody will obey it. There seems to be some doubt now whether if he did give an order to do certain kinds of things, whether it would be obeyed. So I think that the army is feeling itself along very slowly and on the, also, as I say, not willing to um, go too far in order to annoy the United States, um, on which it is uh, totally dependent. So whether it is a coherent force capable of doing something, um, I think probably much better to think about it is there's a kind of uh, an alliance between Tantawi at the head of the army and Omar Suleiman and somehow or other, they have to work out how, it's going to, how they're going to get from now to September and the presidential election and the hope that, uh, that Mubarak will actually go and a new lot of presidential candidates will appear. Professor Owen and Turk, um, mm -hmm. so the U.S. government has given mm -hmm. approximately $30 billion, $35 billion, I guess, mm -hmm. to the Egyptian military mm -hmm. since the Camp David Accords of 79. Does, is that the avenue of U.S. influence, more with from the Pentagon to the military versus what President Obama is trying to do with the civilian leadership? Well, I think it, I think it is, yes, but I don't know what Tarek thinks. Tarek, what do you think? 
I, I agree with Professor Owen in this, and, as in all things, that, uh, um, yeah, absolutely, it's not simply the money, it's the training. Um, yeah. You know, I was once talking um, with, this is not about the military, but it gives you a sense of how everybody perceives the United States and Egypt. I was talking with a couple of Muslim Brotherhood members, one, a senior member and some, some young guys, and we're talking about the United States, and the young guy says to, this, we're, we're listening to the senior member, and I says to him, I heard that America is about to fail. America is about to collapse. Is that true? And he said, my son, I don't want America to collapse. America feeds me right now. I can't have America collapse. And I think that, you know, so the dependence on the United States, of all, you know, of the military, Egyptians in general believe somehow that we are very dependent on the U.S. I think we have a lot of leverage, and so when people say that the United States doesn't have any leverage, I think they're just shirking responsibility, and particularly with the military. Thank you, thank you. Yes, my name is Sarah Altintawi. I'm a PhD student in religion. Um, my question, unfortunately, is also about the military in Egypt. Um, my question is this, this idea that the, that the army is this beloved force, I think, may have started to crack last night when many of us were watching uh, snipers fire on protesters and the army stood back and watched. And from what I can tell, this has had quite an effect on this unblemished image of the army. So my question is, is there an end game to what's going on in Egypt? that does not involve a military government. And um, if there is such, if there is a possibility for a coalition government of protesters, El Baradai, Muslim Brotherhood, et cetera, how do we get there? Thank What's you. What's the great, process by which you get there? Great question. Could I just add to it with your permission? I was watching the same live video. It was murky. Is there a distinction between the army and the security forces? Oh, absolutely. And are they acting? in a very different fashion. Yeah, absolutely distinction between the army and the security forces. Uh, the, the question that you ask, is there a scenario here that does not put the military in control at any point, right? And that is the problem because I think even those among the opposition are, some are willing to have a kind of interim government in which the military uh, take, plays some caretaker role and while Rami may believe that uh, uh, Omar Suleiman is Yerozelsky, I look at the Egyptian experience with military government, it's not a good one. In Egypt, they don't like to go back to the barracks. That's just our historical experience. Let's go with it. So, so there is a way in which you could actually get from where we are today to a, to, to a, a, a process, in, to, to an end point in which the military is out of politics. Okay? But I cannot see it happening without significant U.S. pressure. So there is a roadmap. I've actually written it up, and, and I won't bore you all with it because it will take more than my allotted time. But you could do it. The problem is that you've got to get the, mil you've got to get the military on board with this idea that it, it's not going to be able to control this. And this is something that they're reluctant to do because there's a culture in the military. Egypt is the pivotal nation. Egypt is uh, under severe threat from all sides and all angles. And how can we, and Omar Suleiman said something like this today in his interview in, on the Egyptian television. How, you know, we have to shoulder this, you know, we need strong leadership so that Egypt can shoulder its critical responsibilities. And they're not going to leave this to the irresponsible riffraff, the democratic process that can bring me the Muslim brothers or, or uh, the Nasserists or people who are going to be responsive to popular passions instead of Egypt's hard national interest. So getting them to, to let go is going to be very difficult. Rafi. Uh, just a, a point. We have a very interesting experience in the Arab world with uh, Sudan. Um, you know, people are saying Tunis was the first revolt. It wasn't. Sudan in 1985 was the first revolt that where popular pressure overthrew Numeiri. And then you had Suad al Dahab, a general who took over for a year and made a transition. We had something similar in Mauritania a few years ago. So we have indigenous examples in the Arab world of military leaders who assume power for a transitional moment. And as happened to say Gorbachev, uh, FW de Klerk in South Africa. Um, the people in Northern Ireland, they realize at some moment that the system that they're ruling, heading, is not sustainable. And they realize it for reasons that, you know, psychologists only can tell us, that they have to make changes. And when the army is seen as the guarantor of security, 
and provides that space for civilians to then take over, this is a formula that has worked before in the Arab world and can probably work again. It's a long shot. Uh, getting that transitional mechanism is not easy. Hopefully the Egyptians will do it by a coalition of all of these forces with clear support from abroad for this kind of, of transition, then going to quick elections and building in mechanisms for the single most important thing that has to be instituted across the entire Arab world, which is civilian oversight of security, intelligence, and military services. That is the single most important thing that has to be somehow instituted. The Turks just did it. The Soviet empire, all of them have virtually done it. It can be done. And what Tunis has said, has proven so far, is the Arabs will no longer be the exception to the global tide towards democratization and accountability of governance. So I think the military can play this role, and it's a long shot, but it has been done before and it can be done again. And so the leading question I'm sure someone's going to ask it is, if, if, if you're right, Romney, if military rule since 52 is going to end, who is a, what is a civilian alternative? Is it the Muslim Brotherhood? Is it a coalition of democratic politicians? It is a combination of the two, but I'm sure we'll get to that in a minute. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. My name is Hany Mouafi, faculty at Boston University. Uh, my question is uh, to the panel is about um, a medium-term perspective on participation. Uh, I think the focus on uh, personalities or the military uh, focuses on top-down centralized power, whereas we see that what's happened recently in Tunis and Egypt is really more about decentralized uh, kind of aggregation of power. And the Egyptian uh, government and maybe the Tunisian government having pulled back their security forces, hoping that chaos would reign in the streets and people would yearn for that you know, authoritarian hand from the top again. And we see that people kind of self-organized uh, into these committees. And I think actually it's one of the most beneficial outgrowths of what happened is people found that everybody can have a role. Looking, maybe not in this transitional term, but in the medium term, how can we move towards uh, different societal structures in the Middle East, maybe even parliamentary structures that de-emphasize consolidated executive control and kind of distribute legitimacy across different sectors in society? Thank you. Professor Owen, let's take off. Good. No, I, I find myself speechless for some reason. All right. <laughs> That's a very good question. Uh, yes. Whoever would like to answer. Why don't, Rami, you start, or I can go, <coughs> but I'm, just, follow. I'm following the Arab uh, deference to uh, seniority. Um, so, so, I mean, your, your, your point is that... <laughs> very good. So if I... Uh, the, let me... the Arab deference is to Egypt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you go first, Kai. <clears throat> so am I, am I right? What, your question is what exactly? That you're, tr you're trying to find out uh, if there's some process towards democracy that's... that's... I, I see these as, as so radically different. It's not just the young and old. The editorial cartoon I keep expecting is Mubarak calling up Ben Ali saying, what the heck's a Twitter? Because oh, these, so there's a, you're saying there's a kind of generational gap here. Well, no, not a generational gap. What I'm saying is that I, in many ways I think having more representative institutions that are more broadly representative, that involve sure. more... That's what the people want. I mean, the society. people want, yeah, right, absolutely. And I, look, here's the thing, and, and the, something that might explain the variation that we're seeing among Arab states in terms of their, uh, in terms of the protest, right? It may actually be uh, the sort of, the, the level of sort of civil society that you have, uh, you, know, pre, you know, predating the protest, right? So in, this, in, in, in Syria, for example, I, I don't know, but I, 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 would, I would be surprised if there was, if what, what happened in Egypt would be repeated in Syria. And in part, I think that's because in Egypt there is a little bit more civil society. There is a little bit more kind of social organizing than is allowed in Syria. And I would also, like in the Gulf states, for example, part of it is that, yes, these are rich, content states, and so nobody is... Uh, upset with the regime, but another part of it is that the you know there, because everybody's fed by the regime, there isn't the kind of robust civil society that you have in a place where people kind of need to rely on each other. So I think that might be an important determinant of what when you see this protest. Yeah, I'd like to to, um, to try to respond to your question. It's a very difficult question. 
Um, I think in Tunisia and probably in Egypt too, um, there was a complete disconnect, right, between the people, the youth in particular, and the state. There was a sense of humiliation, but there was also a disconnect in terms of uh, this regime uh, not understanding what was happening. When Ben Ali, before he fled, he didn't really understand what was going on, right? Now, there were bloggers. Uh, blogging um, underground. One of them was, called, was uh, Slim Hamamu. He was blogging, his name is Slim 404. And 404 is the message you get when you get an error message on your computer, right? Because of the censorship, you know, you always got those uh, messages. But he was blogging trying to uh, circumvent um, uh, the, the censorship of the internet. Now, when the interim government, the second interim government was created, he got a... Um, position in the government. He's Secretary of State for the, for the Youth, Secretaire d'État à la Jeunesse, right? And during the, the, the ministers, all the ministers meeting, he tweets. And so you can read, you and I can read everything he's thinking about the meeting and everything that's taking place. He's probably censoring a few things, but it's quite fun to, to look at that. So, but it's, it's, very, uh, it's very unrealistic for me to see that because on the other hand, there are also, you know, old generations within this, uh, this ministry. So how, the, the presence of Slim Hamemu is an anecdote, but it's very interesting. You know, will it, will it hold somewhere? Will it have an effect? I'm not sure. And I think I can't really respond to your question except by giving you this anecdote. We'll, we'll have to wait and see really, you know, how things will, will develop in, in the in the coming months and years. Thank you very much. We would normally end about now, but we've decided to extend this uh, for 15 more minutes until 7.30, and thank you for your patience. We have so many people who want to talk. We'll try to get in as many questions and as many brief answers as we can. Yes, sir. My name is Richard Salomon. Uh, I feel there's a prism that we have not examined in this discussion tonight that I think is very significant, and that is the precepts of religion, the Salaf es Salahi, the elders of the tenets of fundamental Islam, not the Shiites, but the Salafis. And that's an area I'd like to hear discussed. I'm also interested in uh, a more essential opinion of the Gama Islamia uh, and their tension vis-a-vis -vis Al Qaeda and their dislike of one another in the equation. Uh, no. Uh, no leader like uh, Turkey, like uh, Kamal Ataturk, has arisen to lead the country. And this is rather interesting. There's a vacuum there that tomorrow in the mosques, there will be sermons. And there may be someone suggesting the theme of those sermons, but I have not had privilege to sit in there, and I'd like to know what you suspect is going on there. So these are areas that I think are highly important because we have been dealing with autocracies, and in Lebanon, you have a nice split between the Men Maronites and <laughs> the Mennonites, the Maronites and uh, Islam and uh, the way they hold seats of power. I'd like to hear what you think about these essential potential religious elements like Khomeini, who arose in Iran back in 1979. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'll just make a couple of quick comments. Um, uh, it's interesting you mentioned Ataturk. Ataturk's experience led to a rather militaristic uh, army state for decades and decades and decades, which was finally democratized by mild Islamists when Erdogan and the Ju Justice and Development Party came in. So I think we need to look at the Islamists and politics in the Arab countries in the Middle East uh, with, I think, more nuance um, um, and to understand that they represent a, a force that has grown powerful because there was no other force that could grow in the f half a century in which the Arab police state and, and Arab modern security state, heavily supported by Western powers, did not allow any other expression of public opinion, pluralism, or sentiment. When the system loosened up a little bit and Islamists got, were allowed to play the game, they, uh, some of them won, like in Turkey, and they uh, became much more pragmatic and, and, and much more secular. And the balance that you have is a balance which is similar to the, say, Christian Democrats in Europe, where you have a democratic process 
that is defined by the three constituent elements of the Arab world, which is uh, uh, Arabism, uh, tribalism, and uh, Islam. And those three find a balance among themselves. So I think the Islamist uh, boogeyman uh, is a huge diversion and, and really should not be seriously discussed at all. These societies will find their own balance. The Islamists have gone strong because autocrats supported by the West did not allow any other options. When the other options are there, the Islamists then take their normal form, which is 15 to 20 percent, and that should, should be something that people uh, shouldn't, uh, shouldn't worry about too much. Yeah, I agree very much with this. And I'd like to add that when Rashid al-Ghannoushi, the historical leader of the Islamist movement and Nahda in Tunisia came back, he declared that he would never touch the, uh, uh, or never put into question the um, personal status quo, which recognizes um, equality between um, men and women, um, prohibits uh, polygamy and repudiation. And he has also declared that his model was the AKP, the, the, the Turkish AKP. And he also said he, he compared himself and his movement to the Christian Democrats. So in a way, what we see also with the integration of the Islamist movement is really their, their moderation, their routinization into um, uh, political parties that do not uh, claim to be Islamist parties, but very often Islamist uh, parties with a religious or an Islamist reference. And this is the case also in Morocco with the Party of Justice and Development um, that has been there for, for a few years now and participates um, in parliamentary politics. So just to go in the same direction of moderation, and there are a, a force to count with, uh, but we shouldn't use them as an excuse, um, you know, to go against history, against democratization. I, I think Islamists, too, seem to be pretty smart about this now, that they know that their presence can be used as an excuse to shortcut the democratic process. So you see in Egypt, for example, they're, you know, very conscientiously self-effacing. They're not really at the forefront of these things. And so one could worry, and I understand, I get this question a lot, that they're hanging in the background, that basically what we're looking at right now is, uh, is Russia in 1917, but in, in February, right? We're not yet in October. Kerensky versus Yeah, Lenin. Kerensky, right. So al Baradi makes a wonderful Kerensky. Uh, Alex Kesar, uh, you know, uh, our historian colleague, was pushing me on this. Um, and that the Muslim brothers will, will eventually uh, capture any uh, revolution, just like what happened in uh, Iran in 1979. But if you compare the Muslim brothers to the, what, to the Islamists in Iran, the Muslim brothers are a kind of quasi-political party that a lot of people like and a lot of people don't like. Okay? I've studied them for about eight years. I don't feel comfortable telling you they're 15% or 20%, but I'm, they're not 100%. Okay? And I'm not even sure they're 50%. Um, in Iran, on the, on the other hand, that, that these were the, these, this was the clergy, okay? And that the clergy has an enormous amount of power and legitimacy. You can't argue with them. There's a, there's a kind of concept among the Shia clergy, something called, uh, uh, you know, a, you know a, cl a particular clergy, not, not the walayat yeah. al-faqiyah, I'm talking yeah. about marja al-taqlid. You know, that a cleric can be a source of emulation. That doesn't, you know, so you see, what does this guy do? Does he brush his teeth in the morning this way? I'll do the same thing. We don't have anything like that in, in the Muslim Brotherhood doesn't occupy any, uh, any uh, uh, equivalent uh, stature. So I'm not as, as worried, but I understand those who are worried. Uh, but I, I think that, uh, you know, they've, be they've behaved pretty responsibly so far. Thank you very much. Interesting question. Got a good response from the panel. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Dominic Longo. I'm a doctoral student in Arabic and Islamic studies, uh, with deep personal ties to Egypt. Uh, my question is about very short-term strategy um, in Egypt, uh, especially given the negotiation showdown with the protesters, uh, the opposition epitomized by those in Tahrir saying, no dialogue until Mubarak steps down, on the one hand, and then the regime, in the voice of Suleiman, saying, no dialogue until Tahrir is cleared. If you were given the chance to give wise counsel to either side uh, in the next days or uh, week, what would some of the main points of your counsel be? Pastor Owen, do you want to? Well, I, I think that's uh, fairly clear, I think. I mean, you have to show how you get from here to September to the people there, showing that um, 
the revolution is in good hands, but that it's, it's going to be guided towards elections, which will be open to all political parties, and a presidential election, which will be open to all candidates. And you also have to produce some carrots at some stage, and that's one of the problems. I mean, clearly it would benefit whoever is in power if they uh, had some money to distribute. Um, uh, so, you know, I can see what ought to happen. Whether that's going to happen is an another matter. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Thank you. Hi, my name is Natalie Southwick. I don't think I'm old enough to even pretend that I go here. Um, but my question, the thing I've noticed in particular um, with Egypt is that there's been such a crackdown on information coming out of it. Not so much with Tunisia, because like you said, Professor, no one was paying attention. But from shutting off the internet to arresting Egyptian bloggers to the attacks on Al Jazeera and CNN crews this week, there's been a really overt effort to prevent information from getting out of Egypt through many of the traditional channels. And I'm curious what that says about Mubarak and, and the fact that perhaps he doesn't care about how he's perceived now, and also the kind of information that the rest of the Arab world and the international community is receiving about what's going on in Egypt and really how much we can trust. And just late this afternoon, there were reports of further arrests of international journalists. Secretary Hillary Clinton made a very strong statement condemning the Egyptian government for this. So the stakes are, it's a very good question. It was co clear after, oh, sorry, do you want to, go ahead, go ahead, let the fuddle. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> as, as the uh, journalist with uh, three, four distinguished academics, um, I, I should say that, you know, we've seen this over and over. I remember going to Iraq in 1975 and to visit my parents. My father was stationed in Baghdad with the United Nations and they, uh, people at the airport took away my portable typewriter because, uh, you know, you know, I was a journalist. They, they probably knew that, but I wasn't going to work. I was going to visit my parents, but I had my typewriter. And uh, this is as old as time. People take away the means of communication when they feel threatened. I don't think we should worry too much about it in the short run because the uh, uh, technology that we have and the determination of the people will always get around these things. I think uh, just on the point of Twitter and blogging and all that, I think there's been a vast exaggeration of the importance of the social media. It's it accelerates and expands a process that starts with the basic courage of individuals who will stand up and confront the political system that they feel oppresses them. The media helps this process, but it starts with the courage of individuals. I think, I think two things. I think um, you're absolutely right that the Mubarak government's decision to shut off the internet really revealed something essential about this regime that perhaps some of us didn't see. When Ben Ali fell, I was in Egypt, and all of my friends were saying, well, of course that guy, look, can you believe how he restricted Facebook? I mean, this is unbelievable. <laughs> Not knowing what was, in the, what was in store for them when Mubarak finally concluded it was kill or be killed. Uh, regarding Twitter and Facebook and all these things, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, Rami is absolutely right. I mean, my feeling is that these kinds of social media, their relationship to protests, they're like shoes, right? You don't want to go to a protest without shoes. You need to have some shoes. Uh, they'll help you. Uh, but they, you wouldn't say that the shoes caused the protest. And I think it's the same way with this social media. Thank you. It's been a great discussion. We have time for only one more question. You have the final word. Thank you. Uh, my name is Latfi Sebi. I'm from Tunisia. I am also from the city of Sidi Bouzid. So mm. I happen to be right in the middle of the... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, if, unlike uh, Tarek, I don't know if it's a fortune or a misfortune. I uh, learned how to throw the, you know, the hand grenades back. What it, not hand grenades, the gas things. Mm -hmm. But uh, gas. You know, I'm a little nervous still thinking, of whenever I see crowds like this in the streets. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to uh, quickly make a couple of points and maybe ask a question. Uh, and we just have a, I'm sorry, there's a little bit of time left. So uh, okay, certainly, Thank certainly. You. One regarding uh, leadership for the youth of uh, Arab countries. I think the United States, as a government, uh, we're missing a great opportunity because I spent quite a bit of time in North Africa and in the Middle East not paying too much attention to what goes on in the street. We read newspapers, we rely on old-fashioned way of sort of analyzing data, but we don't really have people in there that are intermingling with the young people, as I do. I have a company and I employ people in Tunisia, in the United Arab Emirates, in Egypt, in Morocco. So I always get questions like, 
Why do they hate us? But we love everything American. Uh, when Obama speaks of democracy, do they, does he only just mean democracy for the U.S.? Uh, I try to explain that perhaps democracy and stability are not mutually exclusive, or maybe they are in certain parts of the world. So not paying attention, and I think uh, Rami Sarkhouri uh, brought up a great, up, you know, great point in that maybe 10, 15 years from today, we will be looking at Tunisia, who Professor Zagal said is not that important, but I think geopolitically should be extremely important because maybe 10, 15 years from now, we'll be looking at another Iran. And, and a question. The question is, is the question. what, you know, if I'm looking here at the future generation, future leadership of the United States, what, would, what advice would you give them in terms of how to deal with the street, the young people? 50% of Tunisians are less than the age of 25 years of age. Thank you, Professor Gal. No, I, you know, I didn't say Tunisia was not so important. It's very important to me. And I meant to, yes. Very, <laughs> it's a very important, uh, what has happened is very important. But I was I talking to, about so. the geopolitical um, yeah. level. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, I, I really think it's for the Tunisians to think about the question of the youth and how, how does the youth get new opportunities at the economic level, but also the political level, right? There is a sense of despair. There is a sense that everything is blocked in front of them. And so how do the Tunisians open those opportunities for the youth? And that's the question for all Tunisians to debate today. I really hope, truly hope, that we'll have the opportunity to think about this as Tunisians, but also that this will be the case in, in Egypt too. So I, I sympathize with, um, your desire to, to fix that problem. But the, 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 I think the, the path will be very long. That has to be the final word, Professor Segal. It's been a fascinating discussion at a very important time. Thank you for your collective wisdom. Thank you.